Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 331, featuring the fifth and final installment of my interview with Mr. Rob Irving. This part of the interview, we talk about his experiences uh, working on Star Citizen, uh, working with Chris Roberts. Uh, we also talk about violence in video games, uh, griefing, uh, why do people grief in MMOs. We talk about a game called Abuse and SWAT 4 and <laughs> what uh, Rob thinks about a SWAT 5. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Rob Irving. I don't know if ironic is the right word or not for this, but you know, to think about all the how D and D and all those sort of fantasy settings just ripped most of that stuff. I, I think even the first Ultima didn't it have a, like actually had hobbits in there. Yeah, they changed it up, sure called him something else, and <laughs> yeah, apparently hobbits are copyrighted or trademarked or something now. I don't know, but. That's, I mean, I think of that a lot. I mean, given that I, I am a huge Lord of the Rings nut, don't get me wrong. I mean, that, that game aside, I still, I love the franchise. I love the books. I've read them like six times. Um, and it just, it's the reason we have jobs today in the game industry, if, I, if you think about it. I mean, fantasy started there, essentially. And that's not what he set out to do, but he changed the entire face of the world. And then Star Wars came along and did the rest of the work. You know, it's like that's those are the reasons I'm sitting in this office doing this job today, because somebody decided to do something a little creative, and imaginative. So I got some stuff here about the Star Citizen stuff. But I think ah, the, did you want to talk about that? I, I don't. I, I couldn't kind of ferret out if that was okay or taboo topic for you. It's it's one of those things that I've just been staying out of, you know, in the sense that there is a lot of controversy raging around it. That is, A, hooray, not my problem. But, you know, it's like I, I don't feel any need to either, you know, throw sling mud or, or defend it either way. I mean, it's like what will happen with that game will happen with that game. It was, to me, what got me onto that game was... It was exactly the game we had wanted to build, you know, 15 years before on with Wing Commander. Mm -hmm. We wanted to do an online version of Wing Commander, um, which never got off the ground. <clears throat> but basically, I looked at that and I'm like, this is exactly what we were drawing up when we were working on the Wing Commander online design. And so, I mean, yeah, who wouldn't want to see that game? Duh! <laughs> it's like it's if the you dream can do game. That, yeah, exactly. This is. This is the biggest dream ever in game, the game industry, and, well, I sure hope it works. But, you know, it was the difference between when I started and there were 20 people in our office and, you know, what it was when I left when there were 300. It's just like they're, they're, the reason I left is just that simple. I, I wanted to work on a, in a small company, and that, that wasn't feeling like the fit for me anymore. And so I walked away. That's, you know... That's that's it. There's not really much to tell with it, I guess. It's like, a, yes, I think it's the most fabulously, ludicrously huge scope game I've ever seen in my life. But good luck. Maybe you get called in to do the ground missions, you know, right, right at the end of the. Oh yes, and I will make them super hard, <laughs> harder than Wing Four. That would be kind of. I don't cool. know what to think. What was that? There was a magazine that online magazine that kind of tore into the whole thing oh and, you know, oh that, the uh, escapist the escapist, escapist. yeah is that, yeah i well, remember I mean, when that came up because i mean i i had of course pitched into this thing i was very excited about it and that just really i read that thing and i was just so upset about that you know and you know i mean it, i can't really even if it's not even true at all i still i'm upset that even that you know yeah, rumors like that don't just spring out of nowhere. Yeah. That's the thing. Is that there? There is there is certainly some truth to the article, but you know, it's again something I'm just trying to stay out of. <laughs> I don't blame. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like when you left that, it wasn't as a result of some kind of scandal or anything. It's just you no, know, no, some, no, some no. other just... opportunity had arisen. And... Yeah. Well, it was it was just for me personally. It's like. When I started, I mean, are you out, still friends with with Chris, or is that? I mean, I've Chris and I have never really been close friends in, in the first place. I mean, we've worked together a couple of times, but you know, I mean, he knows who I am. It's, but yeah, I mean, we we work together just fine. It just was, you know, for me, of course. Again, this goes back to that very first thing we were talking about, where you can't all be the creative guy, especially mm -hmm. on a game with Chris. You know, and I like to be the creative guy, and that's what I got hired to do initially. And when it was twenty people 
there was a lot of that. But when it was 350 people and things had kind of moved to California instead of Austin, it, there wasn't as much room for that. So it was uh, just, you know, it was time for me to go. I wasn't doing the job I wanted to do anymore, basically. So I will ask just one other thing about this. Not, not to do with that part, but somebody had floated the idea to me that, you know, the problem was there's too much money. And that actually would have been better off if they hadn't had, if they had actually come in closer to their original goal, it would have been, you think that's, uh, there's something to that? Uh, To to some extent, yes. I do think that certainly it taking off so fast and so ridiculously successful certainly changed it to some extent. But I think that that Chris always has aimed that high. That's always what he, he looks for. You know, he's he's not trying to make just another Me Too game. He wants to make a Chris game. You know, it says a Chris Roberts game on it somewhere. It's going to, and it needs to be big. And so he always is going to probably go bigger than he should. But, you know, this comes from me with the, my producer hat on. It's like, at some point, you got to just stop, man. That's what my producer hat says. My designer hat says, do it. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's it's a hard thing, and the thing that he has going for him is that, yes, he's got enough money to make a really big game, and he doesn't have anyone telling him when it has to be done. So so really what he needs is he needs somebody to come in that could just say, okay, we're going to cut this, cut this, cut this, cut this, and it's going to be on the shelf in a month, right? That's what he doesn't want, though, and that's what you know. That's the thing that he built for himself with, the, with this campaign is, you know, I get to do whatever I want, and that's... Sometimes that's not a good thing, you know, it's it, because uh, another thing I say to designers when I'm, I'm interviewing them or when I'm telling, you know, kids in school, if you want to do game design, you have to be able to say no to yourself first. You're going to say no to other team members, too, but you're going to have to say, say no, no to, to yourself. yourself. What, what, what do you want to? You've got to be able to stop. I mean, you've got to be able to put the brakes on and go, oh, this would be a great idea. This, yes, that might be a great idea, but it's not going to happen here. You know, it's you have to be the first gate, you know, and at some point you have to say, OK, this is this is a stopping point. We're going to do this thing. And no, we don't have room for any more great ideas, but I'll write them down for the next game I make. You know, or if we do a sequel, we'll do those good ideas in that game. A feature but creep sort of a... You can't yeah. keep going. You just can't keep... It's like, yes, you could eventually make a game that does everything. But, you know, that's that, – that, as a coder and as a designer, that, that is where you get yourself into trouble. Is, I know people who like to write a, a system in their code that will handle everything. It's like it needs to do one thing, but they want to make it so if you need to do ten other things, it's ready. Like all that's doing is, is spending more time on it than you need. I mean, and, and that, again, goes back to the producer hat of, now how long does it take just to do the one thing? All it needs is the one thing, but you know, that's, it's not always easy to get people, creative people, to work that way. It's like you, you get a grand vision. You want to go the big way. You don't want to go the little way. No, timid, timidity doesn't seem like fun. You know. <laughs> yeah, nobody gets into the nobody gets into this business just to make, like you said, me too games or a, exactly. Safe. You know? I mean, you... sometimes you're gonna end up on a project that you just. It, it's almost like torture, but that's that's the job side of it. But for the most part, you're making things that are fun. You know, I mean, I, I don't like as a producer, I don't, I don't envy, you know, that that person that has to go in there because I mean, all these think of all the, so many designers I've had on and they've, they've all had a story like, well, that game would have been so wonderful, you know, with this, you know, basically this jerk said I had to we had to have it out on the shelf and we, we didn't have enough time to do what we were Darn you trying financial to do. <laughs> I mean, you think that, you know, I don't know what to make of it. <laughs> it you do uh, feel like a meanie when you're, when yeah. you're a producer. Sometimes you have to be the meanie. You have to go, please, just everyone shut up. We need to get on the schedule, on the budget that we set out at the beginning. What are you doing? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it feels like being a parent sometimes. I mean, you know that their heart's in the right place, but it's still, you know, you, you have to treat it more like a job than anybody else does if you're a producer. <laughs> I mean, just thinking back to your own experience with some of these projects that were, that were canceled or kind of got rushed out the door. I mean, is, is there are there a couple that you really feel like you know, if I just had a little more money, a little more time? Pack strike certainly. I mean, like you said, the the rating on that one. Ooh, I don't like to think about that part because I felt like the game was really good. It was so much better than it ended up being for everybody who played it because they just couldn't play it. And like it, it 
if we had had another six months to let the technology catch up a little more, to, to do a little bit more optimization, that game could have been so much more successful. And we probably would have gotten to do our sequel. <laughs> but yeah, that, I think that one is, of all of them, is the one that was most, most broken by just the timeline. But uh, the rest of them, like, you know, Chris and Richard at Origin didn't really ever have to hit a schedule. They, they just went as far as long as it's they could. It's ready when it's ready. That's yeah, it's ready, it's ready when we say it's done, you know? And so, you know, Strike Commander didn't have that problem. Wing Commander didn't have that problem. We, we got done with them, you know? <laughs> because we were going to get done with them. <laughs> I don't care who's telling us what to do. <laughs> but, yeah, the ones that got canceled are the ones that really sometimes make me sad because it's just like everybody's baby might be a little ugly, but it's still, you know, it's your baby. And you, you, don't, you don't want to have to say goodbye to the babies, even even if they're not the best game in the world. What was that? You got a, something you said on that other interview. Some, like, even though they're malformed or something, they're still... <laughs> that was just a very uh, <laughs> striking metaphor that you use. It's, it, it, but it's it's how you feel about a game. I mean, it's certainly how I feel about a game. When I, it's, it's, you know, it's a piece of you that's going into this. It's you, You're not... You, you can't separate yourself completely from it. It can't be just a job because you don't get fun games out of just a job. Mm -hmm. You get fun games out of people who are passionate about them and, and you know, who care about them and want them to be perfect. You know, so I guess, yeah, that, that, that the, the baby metaphor is really, it's the one I use the most often because it really is like that. I mean, you don't want to hear it if they think it's ugly, but... Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're going to have to, and you're going to have to get used to it, too. It's like, your kid is terrible at math. Sorry. Okay, fine. I will you're, accept you're, it now. You're just a bad teacher. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. It's, it's obviously your fault. <laughs> All right, Rob. So I'm going to end with this last question. This was a submitted by a viewer, uh, Victor Freer. I believe is how you say his last name. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I want hopes. Uh, but anyway, here's the uh, the question. Is there any hope for SWAT 5? Oh, SWAT 5. Wow. I really loved SWAT 4. I really did. I don't I don't know what, what happened to Sierra's licenses, to be honest. I mean, when they shut down that, that shop, uh, Universal basically had just decided they weren't going to make any more console games. or You know, and, and PC games were only Sierra, so... I don't know what they did with all those licenses. It would be cool to see a SWAT 5. I thought SWAT 4 was amazingly cool. Just because it's so different than your standard shooter. Because it's, you know, the non-lethal portion of it, to me, was interesting. Um, it sounds like you're not really in, in favor of these sort of violent doom, uh, that sort of thing. I'm not a blood and guts game sort of person. Uh, I prefer to work on games that don't go that route. Do um, you worry about stuff like that? The kids playing I, it? You know, that sort of can't be good. I mean, I, I know that the, the counter argument to that is, well, it helps you get out that aggression so it doesn't come out in some other way. But I'm like, there, there are better ways to do that, I think, than, you know, violence against other people. It's just, mm -hmm. it, it, we've already got so much of that in the real world. I, I don't think we need to glorify it in gaming, but I understand that that's a huge marketplace and that's not going to change. I mean, think about how many games are about wars. Not a pretty thing, but there you go. That's, that's what people play. So, yeah, I mean, I, I prefer to go the less violent route with my games, but, uh, you know, it's... I mean, would it's you a, say you have moral qualms about those those games, or is it just kind of a... Yeah, I guess that, that's really what it comes down to at that point. It's like, yeah, I guess I, I personally don't think it's the right way to go. So, yeah, I guess that's moral qualms. If, if is there a game, it, is there like a game that you feel like just steps over the line and really should just be banned totally? Or what? I, I wouldn't ban them, but I would, I would certainly hope that, if nothing else, parents are looking at what their kids are playing. I mean, what is that, and why are you playing it? But, I mean, other than that, no. I mean, I, I don't think banning is the answer. I just think that careful, you know, teaching people is the answer. It's like, if, if you're going to play that game, you have to understand that it's a game and that there's a very big difference, you know. And we already have enough problems just with the, the anonymity of the Internet, hmm. Well, yeah, yeah. The, so you had some of those problems with uh, with the uh, Ultima Online, right? And the <laughs> ah, players just—I mean, there's, something there's about the anonymity brings out the worst in somebody. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how much people just 
you take them a little distance from civilization, basically, where there's there's a, one one layer of, of gauze between you and the norm, and normal society, and some people just take that as an opportunity to act like brats, and it's just it's terrible. I mean, people can be so bad to each other anyway, but the internet makes it just ten times worse. And certainly on Ultima Online, there are, there's there are some, people... some pretty bad characters on there. So, so. They delighted in tormenting other people. I mean, that, that their game Reefers. was not the game that we made. It was their game was just ruining everybody else's game. And I, I it, it absolutely startled me when I saw this happening. I'm like that that was not something I expected. And you know, it was one of the first MMOs, so. It was it was new to everybody, but watching that that ten percent of your audience that really their whole pleasure in your game is ruining other players' games, it, it just that that just makes me sad. Uh, I it just, just I wonder about those people. I mean, are they are they really troubled psychologically? Yeah, it's never really rough or, childhood. <laughs> you know, I can understand I mean, if you have. Would a be bad... concerned as a society about that sort of thing, or, or I just you know. I, that, that's something that I, I do worry about. It's like, does, is that some kind of a, a sign that we're really going the wrong direction here, or is it just there are always going to be a few a few bad apples? You know, I don't. What I don't really know worries me. I listen to some. Sometimes I listen to these sort of apocalyptic podcasts, and you know, there's a couple of them. And their big theme as well. You know, there's a lot. There's a segment of society that they would just love to be these absolute tyrannical bastards, violent. You know, but the only thing that keeps them in check is like fear of the law. You know, if you didn't have that anymore, you know, these people would be out, sort of like what you see in these uh, Ultima Online, but it'd be in real life. I mean, <laughs> do you exactly. think it's that bad? Yeah, I mean, it's. I do think it's that bad. That's the thing is, I mean, look at what you see there on, on just in an online game. If you feel like you're not going to get in trouble for it, mm-hmm. there are just some people who are going to act that way. And it, the concerns, the concern for other people isn't there. I mean, they're not... They, they don't even think about it. I mean, if you watch people just driving, for the most part, people are at least a little courteous. But there's a group of people that have no interest in what anyone else is doing. All they're looking at is what they're doing. And, you know, they're the ones who are cutting you off and riding your bumper and all. Because there are just a segment of the population that don't have any empathy for other people, you know? So you see it in games. You see it in life. It's, it, you, the, the, one, the one line we have is that there is some fear of the law. Or I think you'd see a lot more of that in life now. And we are seeing more of that now, if you think about it, with all the crazy gun stuff and everything. I mean, the, the world's a little scary right now. Well, I think we could bring that back to the SWAT 5 uh, somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we got down that road. Well, yeah, it makes sense. But, there's, there's a connection there, right? You know, the the, the non-violent game. and the Thin blue line, so, yeah. I mean, if you were well, going to do a SWAT 5, what, what would it look like? Honestly, there isn't too much I would change from SWAT 4 is the thing. I mean, I felt like SWAT 4 was just where that franchise needed to go. It almost was like I can cap it. So if I did a SWAT 5, it would probably be a lot like 4. But we'd have a little better technology, so it could probably look a lot cooler. But I would certainly... I could do the whole looking into somebody's eyes thing, right? <laughs> no, no, not that far. That's, that's too far. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I certainly would... would continue to emphasize the idea that this is not your typical shooter you're not supposed to run around and just shoot everybody your job is to arrest these people i mean that to me was the most innovative part of that game is that it wasn't a shooter it was a tactical game and it that that is a, a huge difference actually so i, I think that it, if there were a five which i would love to do a squad five to be honest um it would be more of the same well, i think after this project's up you could do a Launch a Kickstarter. Sounds like there's plenty enough interest in it. There we go. Well, let check it out. See if you know. See if we can raise a little money for SWAT Five. We'll have to. We'll have to check out the waters up there. <laughs> All right, Rob. Well, thanks so much for this. It's been been amazing. Hey, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, you, you give you give a good interview. I've I've read some some reviews that said the same thing, and I'm like, well, I'll wait. <laughs> Was there anything you, make it... you wanted to, to add here that we never got to? I think we covered more of my career than I even thought possible. So, you know, <laughs> the only one we didn't talk about was abuse, and that game was awful. Oh, abuse, yeah, I saw that on the list. Was it? I seem to remember seeing that. Is, is that an Amiga game, or am I thinking of way it off? Game. It was a side-scrolling platformer um, shooter game, but it was a multiplayer uh, game. I mean, it was it was just it was just wrong. 
And then we let the testers build levels. So of course, what levels got voted for? Well, the testers liked their levels. So those were the levels we got in the game. <laughs> so it, it, was, it was weird in so many different ways. It, it was something that I think Origin spent almost no money on, so they didn't care. But uh, yeah, that was, that was a very, very so painful. It's kind of an odd duck for their line off. <laughs> It's that one game that we never talk about if we can avoid. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun. It's it's kind of a, a nice walk down memory lane to think about all those old games and because you know that, that you put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into those well, games. Babies, right? The, even <laughs> even abuse, right? The, so yeah, even <laughs> strike. I bet it would play great on a new computer. <laughs> Once we get the Pentium nineties, you know we can. Abuse. I, I, I don't have to know. go check that out again. That I know. Really, it has a good music. I mean, there's got to be something good about it, right? The... Music was cool. I mean, I thought that the, just the, the the mission structure, I thought we did a pretty good job on that. It was just, it was a little too ahead of its time. It just... <laughs> if it had the VR, it would have been awesome. <laughs> that would be cool. Hmm. Maybe that's what needs to be done next. A new Pacific Strike. Change the history of the war. Hmm. <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with uh, a review of XCOM 2. So stay tuned, especially all you uh, strategy fans out there. As always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your support of my show. It really means a lot to me, guys. You have no idea. Uh, I want to welcome a couple new uh, Ratrions, uh, Jan, Tim, Rob, Joe, and Ingo, and uh, Seth. Well, Seth's not new, but he uh, stepped up his contribution. Uh, so thank you guys very much. And, and Ingo, uh, Ingo actually sent in a little message with his. I thought I would read that. Uh, thank you for your nice videos, the ale of the week, and especially for an interesting insight on rats in video games. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much, Ingo. You're very welcome for those rat insights. Uh, if you would like to support the show, just go to that Patreon link in the show notes, or go to mattchat.us, or mattchat.us, and you can uh, contribute via PayPal or a couple of other, other options. But no matter how you support the show, I really appreciate it, and thanks. All right, what about that news from the Mad Cave? So I've got two bad news items here. The first is that Microsoft has shut down uh, Lionhead Studios, that's Molly Nose Studio, they were working on Fable Legends, that got cancelled. Um, they also shut down another studio called Press Play Studio, and those are just two. I think they might have shut down uh, as many as eight, one of the articles I read. I'm not really sure what's going on here, I guess it must be, uh, they, these, these, uh, must be running out of money, I suppose. I uh, don't really have a lot of details on that, uh, but anyway, it's bad news, of course, for Molly Nose fans and Fable fans. Uh, and let's see, other bad news, uh, Yahoo Games is shutting down. Uh, this was sent in by somebody named Elizabeth Barton, the wife. Uh, apparently this is the signals the death of in-browser Flash games. So I'm not sure how many of you guys and gals still play uh, browser-based Flash games, but I guess that all the iPhones and smart devices are kind of cutting into that market uh, and Yahoo Games, I think, was one of the bigger ones, right? I remember playing uh, chess on there. And so anyway, if that impacts you, uh, let me know. Okay, better news. Uh, Daniel Spadoni wrote in about the Secret of Monkey Island fan movie. It's a little 18-minute homage, I, I guess you could call it, tribute video. Anyway, it's a lot of fun. Uh, definitely go check that out. And uh, somebody else wrote in about a game called Jesus Christ RPG Trilogy. Turn-based RPG based on a obviously on a religious theme. Uh, now, I thought this was some kind of parody at first, but it appears to be legit. Uh, so if you're Christian and you want to go check that out, uh, let me know uh, what you think. There's a little controversy around it, I guess. Uh, but anyway, it looks to me like it's not intentionally sacrilegious or anything. Uh, so go check that out if you are so inclined. 
And then uh, finally, the book uh, has been proofread now. It took me all week, but all those proofs, all those pages have been proofed. It's like, I think this book is over 400 pages. Uh, anyway, all that is done. It's in the publisher's hands now, and hopefully I will soon have more details for you as to when that book will come out. But anyway, if you're a fan of this show, I think you will agree it's pretty much a must-read. At least I hope you would agree with that. All right. Uh, what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I've got something really weird. Uh, this is a, at least weird to me, a, a something called Ramoon drink by Shirokiku brand. I believe this is out of, yes, product of Japan. Uh, so I thought I would expand my horizons a little bit by going to the local uh, Asian grocery store and they had a whole bunch of beverages I'd never seen before. Uh, apparently this is quite popular in Japan. A couple of people saw this on a picture I posted on Facebook and said that they had uh, tried these before. Uh, it's, it's, it's a drink with a warning label on it. It says, warning, do not swallow the plunger. Throw it away immediately after opening. Plunger? Uh, okay. Adults should open the bottle for small children and supervise drinking. Good. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm starting to get a little worried about myself here. Uh, do not try to remove the marble from the bottle. So there's, there's a marble? Uh, do not freeze the bottle <laughs> or store it in direct sunlight. <laughs> but don't get it wet. Uh, do not consume if the marble is broken, missing, or descended. Okay. Ingredients, carbonated water, high fructose corn syrup, citric acid, and artificial flavor. <laughs> okay, well, at least they're honest about that. Anyway... Okay, let's see. Instruct oh, how to open. We've got instructions here. Remove the seal. Uh, detach the plunger from the center of the cap. Place the plunger on top of the bottle. Press down firmly with the base of your palm to release the marble. Throw away the seal cap and plunger. Uh, have fun drinking remove. Okay. There's a little helpful diagram there. <laughs> what the hell am I... I got myself into. Okay. You guys that drink these all the time are probably laughing hysterically. Okay, what? Is that unscrew? Or? It's like a little, I guess that's the marble they were talking about. How do you open this thing? Uh, okay, huh? I shouldn't have thrown these directions away. Uh, remove the seal from the top. Detach the plunger from the center of the cap. Detach the plunger from the center of the cap. Uh, has it just flipped off? Man, maybe I need my parents here to supervise this. How do you remove the... Uh. Well, it doesn't screw off. I don't see a... I'm missing a piece here? All right. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay, I guess you have to keep this piece on it somehow. What does this do? Is that pressed down? Oh! Okay, I guess that goes... Well, it's like a little... Does it go like that? Okay, so they've got this in there. Peace. Uh. <laughs> oh my god. Uh. Does that go in there? I need to call the Nintendo. Oh! Okay, that did something. Okay, so now there's a marble in the bottle. Is that supposed to be there? Press down firmly to release the marble. Throw away the seal, the seal cap and plunger. All right, guys, it took about an hour, but it looks like we got this thing in there. I'm gonna go ahead and pour it here in the rather excellent drinking horn. No need to pour this in a glass because it's clear. I don't know, maybe I should just drink it directly from the bottle. Is that the, the point? Whee! <laughs> Man, okay. Uh, 
I'll try a little bit from my horn. Now this is, uh, what is it, kind of a bubblegum-like flavor? It kind of reminds me of a, you know, that, that, that uh, little stick of gum that would come with, say, a bazooka, a bazooka gum or baseball card gum, you know what I'm talking about. It kind of tastes like that. There's a little bit of an orange taste or kind of a citrusy taste. It's kind of like a cream soda. I don't know what the deal is with this marble. That's just kind of weird. I mean, isn't that like a choking hazard from hell? <laughs> it's not bad. I don't know what, what the deal is with all the weirdness with opening the damn thing, but it's not bad. I, I don't, I'm not going to say I particularly love it or anything, but it's definitely interesting. Uh, I guess I'll go uh, three out of five drinking horns on this uh, Ramoon drink. Definitely an adventure in opening bottles. Uh, Taste-wise, it's okay. It's not really all that exotic. I was kind of hoping for something uh, as weird as the bottle, but it's pretty much kind of a bubblegum flavored cream soda. Uh, so anyway, uh, three out of five for the Ramoon drink. I'm not even going to try to pronounce <laughs> the rest of this bottle. Uh, so anyway, apparently that's fairly widely available, so let me know what you think. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking up for quotations about saying no. And I found this one uh, that I thought was really, really nice. It's from a John C. Maxwell, an American clergyman. And it goes something like this. Learn to say no to the good so you can say yes to the best. See you guys next week. Drink this. What is it? It has no name. Many brave men died to bring it here from the galaxy of pleasure.